Good morning, church. All right, trying to start off with a strong voice. First off, before we dive into this, just glad to be here. Good to see you. As some of you know, I've been ill, picked up a virus or something in New York, and I blame the Canadian wildfires. It has going to have long-term effects. So as a note, there will be coughing today. I cannot help it. It's going to happen. And at some point, it may be long-term hacking and whatnot. I promise I'm okay. And I also promise I'm not contagious, so the doctors say. But we'll get through this. I have two shots of abuterol I just took. I have a cup of coffee. I have cough drops and your patience. Thank you. The doctors have checked me. It's nothing too serious. <laughs> it's nothing to worry about. <laughs> now to God. <laughs> to God. Worship, worship. <clears throat> In this moment. Today we're going to talk about being in a moment. Life's made up of all kinds of moments for sure. And, and sometimes we have these capstone moments which are so big and so huge that it's almost life defining and they get ahead of us. But there's these other moments that when we look at the full picture of who we are and what we're able to become and who we might become, especially in the idea of growth, there's these moments of transition where we choose whether we will diminish in who we are and who we can be, we will just simply coast We'll move on to something greater. We'll grow. We know that happens throughout all things in life. You can think about particular moments in cinema in which it transitioned. There was a change. There was a, a thing that transformed the way that we experience movies from black and white to color. From even those moments in which there was just orchestras playing and the text was on uh, the screen, but that <coughs> time period in which they could vocalize and you can hear people actually speaking, life changing. And then even the technology in cinema where we went from, you know, basically stop motion, claymation and such to the CGI being such a degree that you look at it and go, wow, is that real? Is that really happening? It's so powerful and convincing. But there's some things we look back and with nostalgia, we can appreciate what it was in the past. But we acknowledge that there was moments of growth and transformation. We expect that to continue. Same thing happens in the way that we experience sound and music. Do you remember a time, some of you might remember having a boom box that you carried around and only the coolest kids could be the ones that would carry it up on their shoulder as ridiculous as you might look and as deaf as you might become. But there was a transformation from that to get real pure audio sound and even uh, with the advent and the renewal of vinyl in the last uh, decade or so, <coughs> there's these moments of transformation in the way that we experience sound and trying to really get there with now with audio DAX and all kinds of great technology. The same thing happens spiritually. And of course, that's far more important. These moments of transformation I want us to consider Abraham, Abram, in that for just a second. God's so good at giving us these examples of what's possible, of what we can possibly become, spiritually, who we can become in relation with him. And this is the most important thing we could ever consider. These moments, in this moment, who might you become in relation to God? How do you develop not going back, wavering in your faith and becoming something less than you are now? Not simply having a moment, a, a, a time of consideration where you just coast through and accept this is the way I've always been. I guess it's good enough. But what if when you encounter a moment, you see the opportunity to grow, to step beyond what you've ever been before? This is the beauty of Christianity. This is the beauty of what God wants for you. You are not set in who you are right now in this moment. You have the capacity to become someone greater in the Lord because of your faith and because of your faithfulness and because of the object of your faith, God. We get that with Abram and Abraham, don't we? But he's, he's difficult because it seems so grandiose. In Genesis chapter 12, we get that introduction to the faith of Abram, don't we? He's 75 years old, it tells us in verse 4. And that's fairly interesting in the great history of the Bible. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. He's 75 years old and God has called him out of his homeland. Can you imagine that moment where God speaks to you 
and challenges you to do something well beyond the expectation of your culture, your people, your family. To be sure, we know he's a descendant of Noah. We know he's descended from uh, Shem in particular. You can read about that in chapter 12. We know that if you add the numbers up, there's about a 50 year period, give or take, in which it could have been that Noah may have met Abram. But after that time period, a good 25 to 30 years later, God calls him to leave his country and to leave his people. He was in Ur of the Chaldeans, a polytheistic place. We don't know if that's exactly how his family was or not, but he heard the call of God. And then out of this incredible amount of faith, he left everything to go to a land he did not know, to follow a God we're not sure how close he was, but close enough to choose him. And in that moment, he heard the promises and the blessings and the offerings of God, and he chose not to keep the same of what he's always been. He chose to pursue whatever life God was offering. It must be the greatest. It must be the best. It must be something that's going to draw you closer to him because it's the very words of God. What an incredible faith. It's hard to fathom in some regard. And so it stands as one of those moments, a capstone in the story of Abram that most people know is one of the greatest moments of faith of all time, and rightly so. But the challenge for us sometimes, you may feel this as well sometimes, is it seems so, so big that it's really hard to say, can I do that? It seems so great and so abstract that on a day-to-day -day basis, the way we live our lives, we ask ourselves, can I do that? Can I truly have that kind of faith? Brothers and sisters, I think God puts that here because yes, the expectation is yes. And God helps us get there too. Certainly from the other story that most people know about Abram, Abraham, and sort of the biggest maybe that's ever known about him, and that's in Genesis 22. When he's told to take this son of promise, Isaac, and take him up on a mountain and to sacrifice him. Can you imagine? You are of a certain age in <laughs> which you've dedicated your whole life to God from 75 to this point. He was about 100 when Isaac was born. And now Isaac is a young boy and he's being asked to take this son of promise, the one by which all the other covenants of God would rest. And God had told him that. We'll get to that in just a moment. And to take him on a mountain and to sacrifice him. It's hard to conceive. It's hard to put yourself in that position and say, yeah, I would totally do that. Honestly, I guess it's easy to say, but would you? Would you have such conviction and such faith in God to know that whatever promises he made, that you would have descendants that would be innumerable and that you would be the father of a great nation and that you would have blessings incalculable and God's going to give you all of this and it's going to happen through this young boy that God's promised and make good on his promise, but now you're called to sacrifice him? And you say, I still believe in God's promises. I still believe that God's going to keep it, that God is so faithful and so true and so right and so just and so generous in what he gives and promises that even if I do this thing, this sacrifice, God will still keep the promise through the boy. Hebrews chapter 11, that hall of faith tells us that he simply accepted the fact that even if he did this, God would bring Isaac back from the dead. Such conviction and faith in God, hard to fathom, hard to fathom. And yet it stands as an example for us, an aspiration, if you will, hard to grab a hold of because it seems so big and so grand. And however, we have to accept the fact that he's a human being like us. He's a human being that was given a challenge by God, sometimes like us. He was a human being in a relationship with God that he chose to be in and to faithfully pursue, ah, like us. And even still, no matter the situation, he's choosing to live with conviction and faith to pursue God, also like us. So it's not so foreign. It's not so distant. 
Sometimes we allow it to become so concrete because we have this grandiose view of him and we elevate him up and rightly so he, he deserves it as a, a man of faith, but he's still not greater than our God. And our God says, humans who he loves very much, you can have that kind of faith and he's going to help us get there. That's why I love the fact that God in his wisdom has included other moments, pivotal moments in the life of people like Abram, Abraham, they're worth paying attention to and really where I want us to get to today. Go to Genesis chapter 15, uh, 17. In Genesis chapter 17, this is that moment in which he goes from being Abram to Abraham. This is a very interesting moment in which God gives him an especially difficult challenge, but we're gonna see in this moment, and it's short, it's really interesting, but it's short, <coughs> where he has to deal with the fact, will I remain how I've been, which is of course quite faithful, really quite faithful up until this point. Will I remain who I am? Will I back away in my faith and waver? Or will I grow in my faith? That's an important thing, human, just like us. And so in chapter 17, we get this, God's gonna make a promise to him. He's now 99 years old, so 24 years he's been following God and had the promise that he would have descendants. Now in chapter 17, he's still trying to work out how that's gonna happen. That's always in his mind. <coughs> we know this because in 16, it's where he had uh, Ishmael with Hagar. And so not quite the way God said it was gonna happen. And we know in chapter 15, which we'll get <coughs> to momentarily, uh, he's praised because of his faithfulness that he would have descendants in God's promises. But in chapter 17, the rubber hits the road, so to speak. At the beginning, he's 99 and God says this to him. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan and as an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Wow, wow, what kind of relationship is that? In which God makes a promise. And of course, carried in this promise is a massive, massive implication for all of mankind. Because it would be through his descendants that the Christ would come, the Savior would come. And it would be a promise that God made. But is Abram, Abraham, a man of conviction, a faith, a faithfulness to such a degree that no matter what God says, he's going to pursue it. You know he got there in Genesis 22. You know he's been there in Genesis 12. But how does he get there? That's really what's interesting to me. And this is one of those tiny, tiny moments that sometimes we lose in the grandiosity of the story, but that are so important, these little details of it that shows the humanity of it and the process he's working through and then how he's developing his faith. And that's really important to me because I want to know how to do that. I don't want to just sit in the faith I've always had. It's got to grow. I certainly don't want to backtrack at all. It's got to grow. And so in this, we see something incredible. Verse 17, well, we'll start in 15, and we'll come to 17 in particular. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. Transformation's taken place. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Important. They've tried to work out the way God's plan should work and their understanding of it. And that's why she sent Hagar to be in with Abraham, Abram, and they had Ishmael. But this was not God's plan. God says, I will provide. And so he's saying, you will have a son through Sarah. That's the covenant. That's the promise of God. But that seems impossible. 
And God says, I will bless her and give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. King of people shall be from her. And then Abraham reacts. This is the detail. This is the moment. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. This is interesting. And people have argued about this for years. He falls on his face. Perhaps he's prostrate in reverence to God. But he laughs. Some people have tried to make the argument, well, he, he laughs because he's joyous, because he's getting a son. I get why you would want to say that. But it doesn't fit with what's taking place here. Because he's pushing back against the idea. Can a man who's 100 have a kid? His body's dead to that. In fact, he's close to death anyway. How is this even possible? And can a woman who's 90, who's barren anyway, she's barren anyhow. How can a 90-year-old woman who's been buried, barren, how can that possibly happen? In her, his understanding of the world and the way the natural things take place, how does this take place? He falls on his face and he laughs. It's a lot to process, isn't it? I don't think he's being disrespectful here. Not at all. God never calls him out for the laughter. Oh, he corrects him, true. But he doesn't call him out for the laughter, which means there's something going on and God's recognizing the process by which humans develop their faith. It's a very real relationship in this. To be fair, in Genesis 18, Sarah does get called out for laughing. Why? Because she laughed in fear and because she also denied it. But not Abram. He's in a conversation with God. And what God says to him is so much, so much to deal with, possibly an obstacle in his faith, in his pursuit, possibly an obstacle. He falls on his face laughing. When's the last time you fell on your face laughing? I don't mean a chuckle chuckle. I don't mean just like a ha 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 ha. I mean you fell on your face laughing. I've been to see some comedians and laughed really, really hard. Saw Nate Bargatze recently. Some of you were there as well. He was super funny. I mean, funny. Even his dad was funny in his show as well. It was a good laugh, laugh out loud. Didn't fall on my face laughing. I have been to times in which I've seen this take place. And usually it happens, not in public settings where you appear in an undignified way perhaps because we'd be so ashamed to be seen laughing that hard. But when you're with friends, when you're with close people, when you're with people that you're used to being with, man, you laugh in a different way, don't you? You just do. Friday night, we were telling stories. I was listening to stories about campaign. Man, I laughed so hard. We're in Pangea and I heard a story about someone climbing up on a duck that was their husband. My goodness, I laughed so hard. Didn't worry about what the other tables were thinking. It's funny in that moment with the people I was with. I remember one time I was at a movie, it was a Medea movie, and I was with my friend Keaton. Oh my goodness, I don't know what Tyler Perry does to write those things. Keaton laughed so hard, he literally fell out of the theater seat onto the floor, that gross theater floor, and was holding himself laughing. So of course I start laughing because of the absurdity of it all. And the whole theater's laughing at Medea and Keaton and the whole thing. Glorious moment. It's in those moments when you're so close to someone, you tend to get that kind of Laughter. I hope that's what this situation is. That Abram Abraham was in such a relationship with God that he's not being disrespectful. They're so close that there's a thing that he's having a hard time. Uh, it seems absurd. The facts presenting themselves a hundred year old man having a baby, a 90 year old woman who's barren having a baby. But he presses through. It's in that moment <laughs> he could have doubted God. It's in that moment he's going to go, yeah, 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 God, whatever. It doesn't fit my understanding of the world, so we'll just say yeah and kind of go on. It didn't work that way. Yeah, he laughed. Yeah, God didn't call him out for it, and it doesn't seem he was being disrespectful. Yeah, it seemed like there's a real relationship going on here that I'm very interested. How do you get that close to God in your faith? That's very true and very genuine. And how do you move past your limited understanding of the world and how it ought to be and accept how God says it's going to be because that's faith. And even though it doesn't make sense to you that a hundred year old man would have a baby and a 90 year old barren woman would have a baby, God said it's going to happen. And if you're a person of faith, 
and faithfulness and conviction, then yes, God, so be it. So be it. God corrects him in his thinking of this, and that's the transition moment. Even though he laughs and says this in his head, and he makes this plea for, for Ishmael to be the, the, the heir there, God says, no. Sarah, your wife, <laughs> shall bear you a son, and you'll call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I've blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear for you at this set time next year. Finally gives him a time frame to move on. And so then Abraham, Abraham is presented with a choice. Do I accept what God has said in this covenant? Do I ignore it? Do I regress in my faith? Or even though it doesn't make sense, and even though it means I have to change my worldview to a God view, do I pursue it? Do I pursue it? In the following verses, it's clear he pursued it. Whatever God says, I will pursue it. This was a moment in which a choice took place. I love it, a pivotal thing. Because it's so human, it's so real, and it's so important in the way we view our own faith. You don't have a moment in which you become a Christian and then suddenly your faith is absolutely perfect and fully matured, fully developed. It's in these moments that you make choices in your faith and in your faithfulness and your conviction that no matter what, God's will be done. No matter what, what God says will be true. And if God says something and makes a promise, I will pursue it. Even if it means I change my worldview, even if it means that it, I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but God said it, so it's going to happen. I love Romans chapter 4 because Paul uses this to say, okay, this, this is how we come to understand it. And he's noting the incredible faith moment that exists, not just the fact that he left his family and went to a land he didn't know in Genesis chapter 12, and not just that he was willing to sacrifice his son, those two huge faith moments, but even this, this moment here, Paul's referring to in, in Romans chapter four is an incredible moment of faith. In this moment, he made a choice, believing in the power of God. Let's begin in verse, we'll start in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all see, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Man, I want to be of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Remember, he's writing to Christians here as well. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. He gives life to the dead and, and calls things which do not exist as though he did. Keep that in mind for the dead body of Abraham and the dead womb of Sarah in the midst of this. But he gave life in Isaac, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, in that moment, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that he had promised that, he, that what he had promised he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, this is important for us, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. He's making a transition, pointing out this faith and the capabilities of God and the faithfulness of Abraham and conviction. There's a lot of things in life and where we may falter and may waver in our faith, especially in the promises of God. But you have a choice in those moments to waver, but please don't. To keep the same steady as she goes faith you've always had, please don't. Or to grow and to be strengthened in your faith. That is a choice. 
God's given us examples of how to navigate it, just like men like Abraham. Consider church, if you will. In today's world, church is a challenged idea, isn't it? There's many people that think it's antiquated, it's dated, just like those black and white movies that was just orchestration, or just like the old way of listening to sound, it's for a forgotten time period. It's antiquated, it's dated. But God's promise was that through the church, the saved would be delivered into heaven, not antiquated. God's promise was that if we were faithful to Jesus, if we would pursue him, if we would be obedient to him, he would add us to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. Church isn't antiquated. It can't be antiquated. But there are moments in our life where we are challenged to value church in the same way God does. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, does it? We know in Daniel chapter 2, God uh, proclaimed that there would be this kingdom he would establish and that it would consume the world. It would grow to that size and that it would never fall. And we know that throughout the scripture passages like Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 and when Jesus was talking and preaching and even John the Baptist saying, behold the lamb and Jesus was having his people go out and say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We knew at that time in the first century there <coughs> was established in Jerusalem, and people say, yeah, 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 antiquated, first century, for a different time period. And yet Jesus died to purchase that church, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and yet Jesus instructed how that church should thrive and exist, and on paper it makes no sense whatsoever. You would establish a kingdom during the Roman Empire? How? And even during Acts chapter 1, when all those disciples were gathered together in the upper room, there was only 120 only 120 and you're going to build a kingdom that's going to consume the world and that would never fall do you not see the might of the roman empire that extended already throughout the world do you not see the religious power that exists in the world how could a church of jesus possibly exist with just 120 people and they weren't people of notability in a societal standpoint they weren't rulers and emperors, not even senators. They weren't even high priests or anything like that. They were just people. But God said, God said it was going to happen. And some people say, but from my understanding of the world, it's not possible. And people of faith say, yeah, 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 I get that. But God said it's going to happen. And how blessed are we that on at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people became Christians. And in Acts chapter 5, thousands more became Christians. And then it continued to spread, spread throughout the world. And how blessed are we today that throughout that history, the church that would not make sense from a human viewpoint and certainly from a worldly standpoint of wisdom has continued to do exactly what God said it would do, grow and thrive. And I know today people say antiquated, antiquated, antiquated. Do you not recognize that there is a rise in the number of churches that are closing their doors? Do you not know that today in 2023 there is a rise in the number of people that have no affiliation with religion whatsoever? Your church is antiquated. Do you not know that there is a rise in the number of people who don't hold your ethical viewpoints or your uh, morality? Do you not know that there's a rise in the number of people who reject Jesus? Do you not know that your church is antiquated? And I say, do you not know that our God has spoken? Do you not know that our God gave his word that this church, his church, the church that belongs to Jesus that he died for will grow, will be established. Do you not know that our God is the one true God? Do you not know that our God cannot lie? Do you not know that our God is the supreme power throughout all the universe? Do you know that our God will not fold? Our God will not fail in his promises. And if you have a small view of God and a small view of his church and a small view of his people, make a choice in that moment. Do not waver in your faith. Do not coast in your faith. Grow in your faith and believe and trust in God. I understand there's a lot of things that are happening in the world, but the church cannot be antiquated. If you only think church is simply coming together for two hours on a Sunday morning and we go through rituals and we have nice pews and a great building and I'm grateful for those things, you're missing the point of church. 
And church is life because our God is a God of life. And church is peace through life because our God is a God of peace. And church is hope, not just on Sunday mornings, but every single day because we aren't just the church when we're gathered on Sunday mornings. It's a very important part of it. Can't sacrifice that. But Monday, you're the church. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're the church. Saturday, you're the church. Every day, you're the church. Grow, church. That's what God created you to do. And when you have these moments and when your faith is challenged and when you may say, oh, I don't know, man, I don't know if it's worth it anymore. And you feel that tendency to waver. Think of Abraham. Think of Abraham. Grab a hold of how he moved closer to God, even though it didn't fit his worldview of what was possible. He knows with God all things are possible. So the church antiquated? No. No, the church is life and hope and peace and certainty in the one true God. The church is growth. If there's a thing that I want you to walk away with today is to be equipped to have faith like Abraham, know that that's possible, and how he did it was to latch on to God no matter what. He listened to the words of God and he pursued the will of God, and the object of his faith would not move, it would not change because it's God, but his faith grew and it developed. And he's counted among the greatest, the most faithful people of all time. But the path he walked on there was one that you, your feet can trod that same path because of Jesus. Will you choose to do it? I think you will. And if you're discouraged, lean on him. He'll be there for you. Do you not know even after he had that conversation with Abram in Genesis 17, God showed up to him in, uh, in, in Genesis 17. He showed up to him in Genesis 18. And he appeared in these figures and he had a meal with him. That's when Sarah found out and had her moment. And do you not know there was other times in which God was there for him, building him and helping him grow. That same God loves you and will be here for you. And that same God established a church, his kingdom, that will be here for you. On this day, in this moment, what I hope you endeavor to do is to strengthen your resolve your determination, your support, your encouragement, your dedication, your conviction, and whatever God has promised. Whatever life God has given, <coughs> given you, love it. It is a blessing. Whatever circumstance you have, love it. It is a blessing. But use it to draw deeper in your faith. I hope you're encouraged by this. I hope you're determined to double down on it. Your church is not antiquated. Your Bible's not antiquated. And neither is God's will. It's always looking to the future, the home in heaven, eternal life that exists for you. Today, if there's a way that we can help you and encourage you, please let us know. Today, if there's a way that we can build you up and help you grow in your faith and you say, man, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know where to begin. Let's start in God's word. Let's start with God's word and let's go through that together. If there's a thing that we can do to help you, to encourage you, to pray for you, to study with you, if even today you're ready and now is the time for you to become a Christian, don't hesitate on that. Let this be a moment in which you become an even stronger and greater Christian you've ever been before. And tomorrow, endeavor to do the same. Think about the moments you have. Life is not about the giant capstone moments. It's the summation of the little moments. They create the big moments. Take advantage of every moment you have. If this is one in which we can help you right now, as we stand and sing, then come and let us know. We'll be there for you.